Hello friends, this is Soft Critical Automaton and it's time for episode 19, ha, see I remembered that time, of my Let's Play a Bayonetta. It would be really funny if I was wrong about that. Uh, anyway, this chapter starts with like a five minute cutscene, no, it's closer to seven minutes, it's about a seven minute cutscene, so, you know, you might want to get a cup of tea or some popcorn or whatever and settle in for a long one. Excuse me sir, may I have my glasses back? Huh? Oh, yeah, here you go. Teresa, how did you get such magical glasses? <laughs> the glasses aren't magic, silly. I can see the monsters without them. Monsters? Not quite. So, uh, has Bayonetta, I mean your mom, been fighting these big bad monsters for a long time? Mummy is a witch, and witches protect people and are very strong. When I grow up, I'll be strong too, and I'll protect my mummy. I love the power pose. Wait, you think witches do what? No, forget it. No point in arguing with a little kid. I'll manage on my own. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Incredible reaction there. Mummy! <sighs> Shit. You never cease to amuse me, Cheshire. I suppose that's your next target. <laughs> I love the detail of him trying to look casual whenever she's uh, looking his direction, but then immediately switching back to cringing the moment she's facing away. This is yours, little one. You didn't cry while I was gone, did you? Nope. Good. Bayonetta, no matter how I ask, no matter how many times, you always say the same thing. Come now, Kitty. You know it was a all misunderstanding. Just... You're so stubborn, you know that? My father. He was a journalist, too. In fact, he was twice the man I could ever hope to be. He was obsessed with one case his entire career. A case so bizarre it took over his life. They could have made a movie of the details. The followers of darkness, the Umbra witches, and their light world counterparts, the Lumen Sages, controlling everything with a power known as the Eyes of the World. Then, the Light and Dark clans suddenly disappeared from their medieval home in Europe. You may be familiar with the town. You're standing in it. Welcome to Vigrid. 500 years later. 500 years. Each clan, working at the behest of the powers that be, sought to lead their fractured world towards peace. They both possessed an eye said to have the power to create history that they used to oversee the world. However, their spirit of cooperation did not last. For amongst them, a pair of young star-crossed lovers conceived a child that sent the clans on a path to ruin. The woman was thrown in jail, and the man exiled from his clan. However, the child remained with the Umbra, raised as a black sheep even amongst the darkness. Since the balance between light and dark had been lost, both clans spiraled into decay. Legend had it that the two eyes could be united to control reality itself. And this legend fueled ambition and desire, leading to a myriad of battles between the clans. In fact, it led to their mutual destruction. My father was mocked for buying such a fairy tale. However, I believed his story. And I believe it more than ever now that I've found you. The memory of the clan lingers on, despite the passing of 500 years. What on earth was my father searching for? And why did he have to die for it? I have to discover the truth with my own eyes. That's why I haven't given up my chase for it. Or you. The head of the Ithaval group, the multinational that dominates Vigrid, 
recently tried to sell an enormous gemstone on the black market. If he isn't selling out in the open, it means we're going to have to acquire it by other means. And that starts by sneaking onto that jet. Luca, that's not a jet. It's clearly prop driven. This is just a really nicely framed image, or, well, that's a really nicely framed image. I think it's quite lovely. Mummy, are you looking for something? I am. How did you lose it? Little one, do you have anything you really like? Something really important to you? The fact that she suggests her soft toy at first and then that is just a really nice little touch. Yes, this. I love it. Where did you get this? You gave it to me, Mummy, for my birthday. When you love something, never lose it. Understand, little one? You must keep it safe, close to your heart. <laughs> Quite a sweet little moment, really. Oh no, Pathos! He just full on is Spider Man at this point. Yeah, see? Props and no jets. I guess we won't be seeing him again for a while, huh? Ah, oh, beans. <laughs> but yep, I make six props and two turbines. That is not a jet by any stretch of the imagination. That said, I do really enjoy the kind of... Um, the anachronicity of this game seeps into everything. Uh, also, this is the first time Wicked Weaves used against as, a, as an environmental thing, which I think is pretty neat. I should have taken a second to read that chest, because as you may notice, it's not the same as the other chests we've seen. Um, this is basically... Uh, well, she says a little bit about how it's very noticeably like a teched up version, which is, or whatever you'd call it. So this item is a uh, damage item, which is single use and basically just damages every angel around you. I've never seen the point of using them, so uh, I'm not gonna. But uh, yeah, the fact that there's these like weirdly high-tech little uh, coffins all around does lend credence to my sneaking suspicion that... Um, well, I mean, we already know that the CEO of Ithabol is planning on using witch corpses for some kind of purpose. Uh, we'll find out later in this chapter that that is probably, for some strange reason, energy production? Um, and while I appreciate the joke of, uh, you know, hooking some corpses up to a dynamo, offending them terribly, and then letting them spinning in their graves generate infinite free clean power, it's not uh, what you'd really expect for um, the villain of such a baroque, fantastical game to be, uh, to be up to. So, I'm just going to grab this. The Valkyrie Military Transport. Unfittingly, for a city of its small size, Vigrid plays host to a large military airbase. The roar of takeoff and landings that engulf the city are not those of passenger planes, but incredibly large military transport jets known as Valkyries. So, more, uh, more Norse mythology being pulled in. And again, they're not jets. So, Luca's dad clearly had the same problem. 
Um, by the way, these notes were written by Luca's dad. That is explained at some point outside of the game, but it's not mentioned in-game as far as I can tell. I've been aboard American military transports many times in an official capacity, and I have seen many of the finest jets up close. However, none compares to even a distant view of a Valkyrie. The size difference is clearly evident, like the difference in size between a crow and an eagle. To think that something so large could fly in the sky is something I still cannot believe, despite having seen it with my own eyes. Of course, there is no doubt that the cargo it carries is quite dangerous, so seeing the plane's huge mass literally drop onto the runway during landings causes me to feel a deep anxiety as if the weight of the plane were landing on my shoulders. It leads one to wonder what the authorities are bringing into this little principality with all the extreme security they have in place. Big Red has long since cut most ties with the outside world and has reared itself with its own unique culture. Perhaps it is this influence that led to the Valkyrie's equally unique design. At a glance, one can see its deep religious influence in the design, or perhaps that the view is simply our deference to a plane born of technology so different from our own, that we simply nod our heads in astonishment at the miracle of flight. So there's kind of a lot to unpack there, because this game technically, like canonically, takes place in 2009. It's got this very anachronistic air, it's very hard to tell when it's supposed to be set, because these planes all look like fantasy art deco productions from like the 30s. Enzo dresses and acts and talks like he's from the 1930s. There's not so much as a mobile phone anywhere in this entire world. However, the Vigrid train platform had uh, modern style LCD screens. Uh, so it's all a bit weird and confusing, but the idea that this is like the biggest plane anyone could possibly imagine is kind of absurd to me because I've seen a 747 and it's bigger than this. Like relatively common huge planes were around in 2009 and they were bigger than than these Valkyrie air transports. So we're shortly going to do our first backtrack and I think it's the only backtrack in this level which is a relief as I have complained about it so many times. But um... Oh, uh, one hit. No, two hits, fuck. So the, uh, oh, God, what was I was saying. Yeah, so um, you can actually fly across the back of here. However, this, pro this fight has two parts. This first seal is a false seal, which then leads directly into the second half of the fight. I, f uh, but you only trigger the second part of the fight once you tr once you try and come forwards here. So I had actually um, traversed all the way back across, found that there was a barrier on the other side of that big hole and assumed that it was just completely blocked off and that there was nothing I could do. So given that, I didn't realise that, um, yeah, if you fight these guys first, of course you can fly across to the other side and backtrack to the beginning of the level. Um, it's, at, like, it's at this point that they really start hiding the backtracks a lot more heavily. Throughout the game, these back backtracking sections can be hard to spot, but like the reason for that is that there are these various sections in most of the larger, longer chapters, but like this one, where you progress uh, past a point that you cannot return. So, if most chapters have sections where, after if you go past that point, you uh, can't uh, backtrack all the way to the beginning or even to a pre certain previous sections, it's not weird that you would. Okay, it's not the first time I fell down a hole. <laughs> Anyway, uh, if you make it all the way back to the very start over here, this is where the first Alphine portal will spawn in, after you fight these guys. So not only is it um, behind a, a break in the level that looks very similar to the uh, impassable breaks in previous levels that you can't backtrack past, but also the reason for your backtracking is hidden. At least in previous ones you can usually see some hint of the fact that you can, you know, spot a portal in the different distance or... Uh, some other such way of spotting that you can actually go this way. They really get mean about hiding it at this point, is what I'm saying. Oh, wow. Uh, these guys can be tough to fight in such close quarters, but um, it's pretty ordinary as fights go, I've got to say. So, yeah. You can just wail on them until they're dead. But it's unusual to have to fight... Uh, tougher types of uh, angels in such close quarters. Fortunately, I've always got that, which lets me grab this, which lets me do this, and then I can just wail on this guy. Um, but yeah, so I was talking about the weird anachronistic technology in this in this game setting, 
And um, I do find it interesting, but at least it means we get to see these like bizarre art deco structures. And it's not just, as is implied in that notebook, an aspect of Vigridian culture that they have these weird art deco technologies because the cars looked like that. The cars looked, the cars in New York at the start of the game all looked like cars from the 1940s. So, yeah. So yeah, this is the second incidence of the out of body uh, challenge room. Um, the first one was pretty easy. This one is a fair bit harder because of the only real difference, namely that the enemies are on fire. This doesn't seem like it would present much of a challenge, but it essentially increases the vectors for damage to three. You have to worry about being hit, you have to worry about your protection orb, defense shield thing being hit, and also now you have to worry about hitting. You can't just uh, freely wail on anything that gets too close to you, which is the trick to beating the previous one, because uh, unless you land a wicked weave or are in witch time, um, attacks would do damage to you instead of them. And it uh, actually knocks you back and doesn't do any damage to them at all, it just damages you. So that means that the tactic of keeping to the middle distance so that they can't get past you and uh, rounding them up and then, you know, wiping them out before they manage to get any damage done to your uh, defense shield does not work here. You have to be more aggressive and generally more proactive and keep an eye on where everyone is. And you have to try and spread your damage around when you're in Witch Time. You can't rely on Witch Time to uh, just soak damage on single targets as much as possible. You have to try and spread it around to keep them knocked back away from your from your protection point. So uh, for that reason, it's difficult to get a good score on this one, at least for me, because I'm, I'm alright at this game, uh, but I'm not amazing. Of course, the other option is to try and get torture attacks early and frequently because you can earn enough uh, magic power with angel weapons to keep doing torture attacks, so you'll keep yourself supplied with angel weapons, and of course angel weapons are unaffected by on fire, you can just do damage. Not my best performance, but I'll take it. So uh, yeah, the, um, the absurdity of the uh, designs is just kind of great. I also think that this is the same kind of plane that we did see in that opening cutscene uh, way back in in Fantasy New York, where um, where we got the witch time tutorial. As we <laughs> one of the problems with these wicked weave um, environmental elements that you have to dodge is that they often fill the screen and they often cause the camera to, to just randomly swing around in a direction you're not expecting, which means it's quite difficult to accidentally cross the uh, kill plane in the holes, which is quite high. Um, but, you know, poor worksman blames her tools, it's all down to me, I'm sure. Regardless, let's go. So I'm just going to read this, and then that'll be the end of this uh, episode, I think. It's going to be a bit of a short one because this, epi uh, this chapter is just long enough that it really needs to be broken in half. Uh, the Gallahorn. At the centre of the man-made island of Isla del Sol, there is a display of sheer military force unimaginable for the likes of Vigrid. A display whose menacing power even I cannot shake. While there is very little public face to these efforts, if my information is correct, the military spending here rivals that of even the great powers of the world. Moreover, amongst the towers of enterprise and government, other buildings stand as anti-aircraft countermeasures. These buildings, a strategic defence initiative known as the Gjallarhorns, are equipped with a battery of anti-aircraft surface-to-air missiles and have been placed in the four corners of the island. What in the world would cause a small place like this to install such dramatic defences? There is also word that the Americans are involved in the armament and expansion of the military complex here. It is said that the Ithavol group is undertaking some sort of next generation energy research and thus has traded rights to this technology for, this, for the added force of arms. It is a not wholly unbelievable story. Seeing all of the military takeoffs and landings here in Vigrid, I don't want to think their destination is actually the place I call home. So... Yeah, that pretty much confirms what I was thinking, that he's making some kind of weird energy thing. Although, that's clearly an excuse for super villainy, and he's saying, well, we're making next generation energy research, it's not, we're not, we're not making some kind of god machine or anything like that. Anyway, I'm going to be ending this episode here because of the way timing works out. I don't really want to split this episode because it is quite an action-packed chapter and it doesn't really have a good stopping place. But I have to, for reasons. So, also, I hope I remember to talk about that pocket watch at the start of the next episode. That's all from me. Bye! 
you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.